السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين I'm indeed very very happy to see all the beautiful faces here and mashallah tabarakallah the patience the brothers and sisters have been here since the morning may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and bless all those who are here who are challenged as well mashallah Challenged in many different ways, people have made an effort to come, and I really, really thank Allah for giving me the opportunity to interact with you here. And I am even more honored to be given the opportunity to speak about one of the greatest of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. We all know that in rank we have Abu Bakr as Siddiq, an. then we have Ali, we have Umar ibn al Khattab, an. then we have Uthman ibn Affan. An. And we have Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon them all. My brothers and sisters, Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu was a cousin of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was a cousin of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Their fathers were brothers. And at a certain stage, the father of Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu, whose name was Abu Talib, was going through financial difficulty. And Ali radiallahu anhu was actually 30 years younger than Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the father of Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an, who was Abu Talib, he decided to speak to his relatives to look after his children. So his brother Al Abbas decided to take Ja'far ibn Abi Talib. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, no problem, I will look after Ali radiallahu an. So Ali radiallahu anhu was actually brought up or taken care of by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Their relationship was very, very strong. And he was in the house of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from a very young age. And this is one of the reasons why later on Abu Talib, who's the father of Ali radiallahu anhu, looked after Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So it's a relationship that is unique. We need to understand this. Brothers and sisters, point number one. Would we ever be ready to look after the children of others? That's a question. Would we ever be ready to look after the children of others? Would we ever be ready to look after people who are orphaned? People perhaps who are struggling from across the globe? Would we ever care to become foster parents? As Muslimin, there is a shortage of people who are prepared to look after others who are perhaps not even related to them. Besides, sometimes through humanity or through your deen. I think it's a very, very strong point we need to raise. Brothers and sisters, I encourage you and myself to a reminder to myself. Let us learn. Let us learn to reach out to others and let us start considering becoming foster caregivers, foster parents perhaps. And inshallah, we will be able to solve matters of the ummah and we will be able to earn Jannatul Firdaus. It's not easy. I do know of some who have done this and trust me, the reward of it is very, very great. So Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was one of them. Therefore, I'm telling you, it's a sunnah. It's a teaching and it's a we follow Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's example, even though he had done it prior to prophethood. Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu, the day that the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him was granted prophethood. And immediately after that, one of the narrations state that he saw Khadija bint Khuwailid radiallahu anha and he saw Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa praying. At that time, the prayer was not compulsory, but it was there. And as they were praying, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was asked a question by Ali, who was 10 years old. He was only 10 years old when the Prophet ﷺ had nubuwa and prophethood. And he says, what are you doing? So the Prophet ﷺ said, look, I'm worshipping my maker alone. He who made me alone. I don't worship the idols. I don't worship sticks and stones. I don't worship people. I don't worship this and that. I worship my maker alone. And I put my head on the ground for my maker alone. And there was a beautiful explanation. Perhaps the wording obviously slightly different from what I've said, but that was the gist of it. And according to one of the narrations, it is stated that he said, let me go to my father. I want to ask him. So he went to his father. He asked, I would like to follow. I would like to follow what Muhammad is doing. And his father told him it's okay. Subhanallah. So he was the first from among the boys, the young boys 
those who had not yet attained puberty to actually accept Islam. He accepted the message of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam while he was in the home and the house of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Just by watching them do something, I ask you another question. How many of us pray at home? That's a question. How many of us pray that our children can see us pray so that they too can be inquisitive and they too can follow at a young age, four and five, you will see them following you even earlier than that. They will want to do exactly what you're doing if you are doing the right thing, subhanallah. And if you're doing the wrong thing, they will follow the wrong thing. It's important for us, my brothers and sisters, to learn a beautiful lesson from this. Let's proceed. As he grew older, he was the companion of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They loved each other so much. Like I said, he grew up in the house of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with Khadija binti Khawailid radiallahu anha. And you know that at the time of the hijrah, the kuffar of Quraysh had decided they want to kill Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's what they decided. They surrounded his house and they were waiting for him to emerge. But the Prophet peace be upon him had hatched a plan, a beautiful plan. What was it? He asked Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu, would you sleep in my bedding? And this man says immediately, yes, obviously I would and I will. So he made him sleep in his bedding. And as he left, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam took a handful of dust and he threw it. One of the miracles was, every one of those who were surrounding the house at the time began to rub their eyes as the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam read one of the verses of surah yasin wajalna min bayni aydihim sadda wa min khalfihim sadda fa aghshaynahum fa hum la yubsirun where allah says we have created a bar a barrier in front of them and behind them, and we have covered them so they will not see. Now, as much as this verse is revealed in a different way, but it is definitely the power of Allah that will blind people in two ways. One is in reality. You know, nowadays, and it's very sad, I met a brother who told me, I really wanted to meet you and I was looking for you, etc, etc. And I told him, brother, I saw you three times today, but unfortunately you were on your phone. I didn't know who you were and I passed you thrice. And I'm thinking to myself, it's like Allah blinding us. You know, put your phone aside for a moment. Let's look at each other. Let's see the path. Let's see the road. Let's see who's around us. Perhaps a person you desperately wanted to see, a friend you needed to see, a relative you really wanted to see might have passed you and you didn't notice because you were busy. You were busy. Sometimes you don't even see the car in front of us. And guess what happens? Six points. Mashallah. Is it six points? More than six points. Subhanallah. Perhaps 12 sometimes. Perhaps a fine as well. You might even be jailed in some countries. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us protection from these points. Subhanallah. Say Ameen. Come on, man. Mashallah. Oh, that's a loud Ameen. Perhaps. Perhaps you need to be a careful driver, my brother. I can see you. I heard it. May Allah make it easy. <laughs> so the Prophet wasallam emerged from that home and they didn't see him. And later on, they discovered it was Ali. Imagine he was ready to give his life. He was ready to give his life. There was a danger that they might storm the home and they might murder the wrong person. Subhanallah. But no, Allah saved him. And he had given his life for Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. This was something very great, something great. The Hijrah is made mention of and he made Hijrah according to some of the narrations three days later when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sent message for him that it's okay, you can come across. May Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala grant us goodness. But there is something more interesting about Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. As he grew older, as he grew older, he wanted to marry the daughter of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam two years after Hijrah. You know what? Imagine someone wants to marry your daughter. Think about who your daughter is. Can she be better than the daughter of the Prophet ﷺ? The answer is no. Can there be Subhanallah? Or in fact, let's think about it for a moment. Here you have Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu coming to the Prophet ﷺ and he wants to marry the daughter. There is a whole story. There are a few narrations, but we're getting to the point. He had nothing. The Prophet ﷺ said, what do you have to give my daughter as a mahar? What is a mahar? A mahar is a gift that is given token from the groom to the bride. 
to say, you know what? This is a token, hadiyah. The value of the marriage is no way connected to how much you are giving. Remember that. The more expensive you make it, the more difficult perhaps you are making it for people to marry. Let's think about it. Here is the Prophet, peace be upon him, saying, Oh Ali, you don't have anything. What about the armor that you have? He says, yes, I've got one armor. I've got armor, but obviously I use it. He says, no problem. Take it to the market, sell it. Whatever you get for it, you can give as a gift to my daughter and we will accept you. He had nothing. Subhanallah, subhanallah. How many of us would give our daughters to a brilliant person who's responsible? He has deen and character, but he doesn't really have much wealth. See the silence? It means none of us. May Allah forgive us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. I promise you, we've become so demanding. We look at wealth. What do you have? The man says, uh, well, I just drive a Toyota. No way. The day you drive the latest Mercedes, come back. If not, get out. We don't mind getting our daughters married to those who have no respect in community. Absolutely no deen, no character, but they've got a lot of wealth. People respect only their money. And we don't mind getting our daughters married. Those are the daughters that at times or mostly they suffer because the, the person they've married has nothing besides money, no character, no conduct, perhaps an alcoholic, a drug addict, someone who's abusive, etc., etc. My brothers and sisters learn from the example of the best of creation. Don't we say that we want to follow him? We do follow him. Why then don't we allow our daughters to marry? those whom they would like when there is deen and akhlaq subhanallah when you have a person with great character and conduct what's wrong subhanallah why do we object so this young man goes with his armor to the market and you know who sees him there uthman ibn affan radiyallahu an he saw ali ibn abi talib selling his armor he says why are you selling your armor he says you know what i want to become your brother in law wow 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 Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu was married to the daughter of Rasulullah sallallahu as well. Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu goes with his armor. He's saying, I want to marry the daughter of Rasulullah sallallahu Now, what would happen in our case? A lot of the times the brothers would actually say, meaning the husbands of the sisters would say, I'm a rich man. And Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu was very rich. This guy is a pauper. He's worth nothing. They would go to the family and say, please don't make a mistake. This guy's got nothing. Look at what Uthman says. Uthman says, you know what? I will buy that armor from you. I'll pay you 400 gold coins for it. And one narration says 480 gold coins for it. I will pay you so much for it and give me the armor. You can take that and get married. Mashallah. What an honor. Subhanallah. Allahu Akbar. Subhanallah. So he got married. He actually took the money. According to some narrations, 480, let's say 480 gold coins. He paid for the armor and as Ali ibn Abi Talib excited going back, wow, I've made some big bucks here. Mashallah, tabarakallah. And he's going back. Uthman says, hey, come back. So as he is coming back, he says, you know what? You're going to be getting married now. I'm giving you a gift. What's the gift? This armor. Subhanallah. I got the armor and I got 480 gold coins. Wow. From who? Someone who is married to the sister of the one I want to marry. Allahu Akbar. We have a lot of lessons to learn from this. Let's look at our relationships. Would we be prepared to give someone money to get married to someone? Subhanallah. And they're not really deeply related to us as such. We wouldn't even give it to our own brothers. Your brother wants 400 of your bitcoins. No way, bro. Not at all. May Allah forgive us. Sorry, I don't mean to interfere in the ruling of bitcoins, but I had to give the example. By the way, Verge is a little bit better than Bitcoin for those who know. My brothers and sisters, I promise you, we're not prepared to let go of anything. Subhanallah. I see some of you are looking at me like, wow, he knows about it. Okay. Yes, I do. I'm also a human being. Mashallah. <laughs> May Allah forgive us. And by the way, the Zimbabwean currency, when it was around, it was just like Bitcoin. Subhanallah. They used to print as much as they could and that was it. Subhanallah. Suddenly, one day they announced it's no longer. <laughs> we tasted that. So Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu was a fortunate man, very, very fortunate. Subhanallah. Here he is and he ended up getting married. What a blessed marriage. To whom? To the daughter of the best of creation. He chose not based on money. So that's the mistake we make today. 
we base our choice on money, wealth. That's, that's a family, they've got a lot of money. Trust me, they might have only money, nothing else. And sometimes Allah will take that away in no time. I know of people who've made a decision based solely on money. And a year down the line, that family lost all their money. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us deen and akhlaq and may he make us choose in the correct way. So this was Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu's marriage and the beautiful story around it. He had such a brilliant relationship with Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu. He named one of his children Uthman. Now you might think, you know what? I only know of Al-Hassan wal Hussein. From the daughter of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he only had Al-Hassan wal Hussein radiallahu anhuma. But after she passed away and she passed away only six months after the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, passed away, who was her father. Do you know what happened? He married again. He had a few wives. From them, the children he had, he kept the names of those whom he loved the most. And we are never told about this. So one of the sons of Ali ibn Abi Talib anhu, was called Abu Bakr bin Ali. Anhu. Another son, he named him Umar bin Ali. Anhu. Why? These were his best friends. No one talks about this. They only say, oh, there was a big problem between them. No way. I would never name my child a name of someone whom I've had a huge issue with. No, it depicts the closeness of relation. He named another child, Uthman bin Ali radiallahu anhum jami'an. May Allah be pleased with all of them. This is an amazing, amazing thing that people don't speak about. I think we need to speak about it a little bit more. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. And that goes to show the names they kept were of value such that they had people with those names who were better than what they thought they were. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a deep understanding. Also with Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu, whenever they saw Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu, they knew that we are going to find Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu close by. He's going to be close. They used to walk together. Although he was much younger. If he was 30 years younger than Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it means he was 28 years younger than Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anh, But he used to love him so much, walk with him, follow him, go around with him. The day that Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anh, was appointed the Khalif, someone told Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anh, that Abu Bakr has just been appointed the Khalif. He was still in his bedding. He quickly got up. And he was putting on his clothing, rushing towards him. And he pledged allegiance as one of the first. Subhanallah. From the first batch, he pledged allegiance to Abu Bakr. And he said, I pledge allegiance to you. And you are indeed Khalifatul Muslimin. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us an understanding. What a great man. So wise at a young age. Very, very young age. So subhanallah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says about Ali. Ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu, he says, Oh Ali radiallahu anhu. Remember, he was one of the greatest of the companions, the top 10. In fact, he was fourth in rank, powerful. He says, Oh Ali, the people will be divided regarding your rank into two. Some will take you very high above your rank and some will drop you very low below your rank. But those who are correct will be neither of the two. They will be the middle path. Those who know exactly what your status is. And this was a miracle of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He had prophesied something that happened later on. Some take him right all the way to Godhood. May Allah protect us. And some drop him and remove him even from the, the fold of Islam. Astaghfirullah. But we are the middle path. We say he was the most honored. We will never utter one bad word about him. Never. We will honor him and his entire family. And we know whenever you say Ali, you must say, may Allah be pleased with him. Radiyallahu anhu. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with every one of us. As he was young, he learned how to read and write. So sometimes when revelation used to come through, he used to be called by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam to write it. Please write this down because he could write. So he was known as Katibul Wahi. That was an honor given to him, Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu, one of the ten who were told, You are from paradise. We've been speaking about that the last two days. And mashallah, mashallah, he was one of them. May Allah make us from among those who earn paradise. You know, there is a very, very beautiful incident that occurred that brings a lot of joy to the heart. The day of Khaybar, when the Prophet ﷺ had surrounded a place known as Khaybar and they were going into the fortress, the Prophet ﷺ at a time of war, 
he made an announcement in the evening. He says, tomorrow, I'm going to give the flag to a person whom Allah loves and he loves Allah. So what happened is as the people were sleeping at night, they were all whispering to each other. Who do you think that's going to be? Who do you think that's going to be? Each one hoping it's going to be him. I mean, if you heard that tomorrow we're going to make a big announcement of a person who's won a huge prize, like later on today, we're going to be giving away huge prizes. Subhanallah. You would love that that were you. You would wait, wait for names to be called out, right? The following morning, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi says, Aina Ali Ibn Abi Talibin. May Allah be pleased with him. Where is Ali? And everyone says, Oh, wow, look at him. He is a person who loves Allah and Allah loves him in return. That's confirmed by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave him the flag and told him, Oh, Ali, you are going into this fortress. I make you the leader of the, those who are going in. And I want to tell you my piece of advice. And this was at a time of war. He says, Oh, Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. Wallahi la an yahdi Allahu bika rajulan wahidan khayrul laka min humrin na'am. Wallahi, I promise you, O Ali, if Allah uses you to guide one person to the straight path, it's better for you than the most valuable of material items of this world. Subhanallah. He says, O Ali, take the name of Allah and remember this advice of mine. Now I pause for a moment for us to learn a lesson from this. My brothers, my sisters, how many of us, when we see people who are misguided, astray, far away from Islam, perhaps they hate Islam, perhaps they are the enemies. On this occasion, it was a war that was taking place. But the Prophet says, be careful. You need to guide the people towards goodness. Subhanallah. What's happening to us today? Do we make an effort to guide people? When we see those who don't like us, they are Islamophobes, perhaps, what do we do? Do we pray for their softening of the heart? Do we pray, for example, for their guidance? Do we pray for them to understand us better? Or do we spew hate in return the same way they did? I'm sure we have a lesson to learn from this beautiful hadith. Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu being told if one person is guided, one, 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 just one, it's better for you than anything that you can have in this world. The same applies to us in our lives. My brothers and sisters, make an effort. Make an effort to work on those whom you live with, those who are around you, and be very, very patient. We give up on our own children sometimes. We give up on our family members, on our husbands, on our wives. Don't give up. Keep trying, keep praying. I promise you, a day will come when you will smile forever and ever. Even if that means eight years down the line, or more, or slightly less. It's the plan of Allah. When that guidance is written, it will definitely come. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. So my brothers and sisters, remember something. When we read these stories, it's to ask ourselves, how can we benefit from its application here today? Subhanallah. And how can we apply it? You need to understand. That's why I'm raising this. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a beautiful lesson. This man, Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu, we were talking about his love of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. Do you know how deep it was? When Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu passed away, later on, Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu decided to take care of his children and married his widow. Subhanallah, her name was Asma binti Umais radiallahu anha. Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu married her and was taking care of Abu Bakr as Siddiq radiallahu anhu's son known as Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr. That was the love they had for one another. Subhanallah. How many of us, for the sake of Allah, for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, would marry a widow or someone who is divorced? I take a look at Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and I look at his life. He married those who were divorced or widowed. That's who he married. From the beginning to the end, besides one. There was only one who he married who was neither divorced nor widowed. She was young, subhanallah. The rest of them were people who were married before. Subhanallah. Have you thought of it? How many of us young people here, or even those who are slightly older, would consider someone who's divorced? What's wrong? She may not have got along with someone. She, got al she can get along with others. Who knows? 
She might get along with you. I know of companions who used to say, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon them. They used to say, look, why don't you marry so and so? I was married to her. I didn't get along, but I have a feeling she will get along with you. Allahu Akbar, Subhanallah. I think we've lost values and morals. My brothers and sisters, we believe that if you divorce someone, that's it. You've got to spew hate. Like I say, mudslinging. You've got to keep on making sure that nothing good happens for that particular person. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a deep understanding. These are the superheroes. These are the ones who, who were told for you is paradise. Do you know why? Because they had these qualities. That's why. They had beautiful qualities. Imagine someone passes away and he knows that's my friend, subhanallah. That's my friend. He had a blessed family. Let me take care of them. Let me marry the widow, subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease and grant us a deep understanding. At least let's, let's take care of one another. Let's understand if a woman is divorced or widowed, it does not mean she is bad at all. Not at all. She might even be better than others. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to understand this and realize this. So this was a lesson we learned from Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an. Then we take a look at some of his statements. Subhanallah, Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an. It's reported that one day he was at the graveyard, not the graveyard. And at the graveyard, there were a lot of people with him. And he decided to address the graves in a way that would be a lesson for everyone. So he asks a question to say, O oh people of the graves, the houses you were in are already housing others. The wealth that you had already belongs to someone else. The wives that you've had are already remarried to others. Now tell us, we have given you what's happening this side. Tell us what's happening on your side. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. And then he read the verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the best provision that you can have is piety. You want to prepare, you haven't taken your wealth, you haven't taken your family members, you have not taken your houses, but you will take your deeds. So do good deeds, my brothers and sisters, those deeds will help you in the hereafter. This man was very wise. He was known for his wisdom, so much so that there are quotes of Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu, that people have compiled. I do know that some of them, people just add the name of Ali to give it value. I don't know if you've seen that happening. You find a statement by someone and when you don't know who it is, you just write Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an. That happens, that happens. When people want to legitimize something, they just put someone's name next to it, you know. And this is why we need to be careful. We need to be careful about these statements. If something doesn't really make sense, or you think perhaps I don't think this is right, do a little bit of research and you might find that it was not his quote. It was not from him. People do it to a lot of others whom they consider perhaps value. They've done it to me and yet I have zero value compared to Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an. And people say this quote and suddenly I see my name next to it. And I say, I've never said that. I've never ever said this man. But they say, no, we just wanted to add value to it. Forgive us. You'll get a reward inshallah. What reward? Cheating? You're forgetting the sin that you're going to get. <laughs> May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us an understanding. So there is a story that I'd like to end with seeing that my 28 minutes are up. Can you believe that? I can't. I think I need a, I need a discount guys. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us 10 more percent inshallah. So uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu once lost his armor, an armor that he had and it was so close to his heart. I'm not too sure if it was the same one that we spoke about earlier, but it was one of his armors, right? He lost it. And some time later, he was the Amir. He was the Amir al-Mu'minin, the Khalifa al-Muslimin. He was in charge and he had vast kingdom. When he arrived in Kufa, he saw in the marketplace someone selling an armor. Lo and behold, it was his. <laughs> he looks at this Jewish man selling the armor. He says, where did you get this from? He says, well, I'm selling it. He says, it's mine. No, it's not yours. I bought it from so-and-so who bought it from so-and-so, whatever it was. He says, no, it's mine. Let's go. I take you to the Qadi. Qadi meaning the court, the judge. Who was the judge? The judge was appointed by Ali. Ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anh. His name was Shuraih. Shuraih was a powerful judge. He was appointed by Ali radiallahu anh. Ali radiallahu anh is taking a Jewish man to that court. He sat in front of this judge whom he appointed. And he says, you know what? 
this Jewish man has my armor. So Shuraih says, Amirul Mu'mineen. Now this was a just man. Amirul Mu'mineen, as much as I would like to believe you, I need to ask you for evidence. Now that's a tough one. You don't have evidence, we cannot rule in your favor. He says, I have evidence. The best of the youth, Al Hassan Wal Hussein, here they are, the grandchildren of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They will bear witness that this armor is mine. So Shuraih says, I know, but children cannot bear witness for their fathers. You know, there is an issue here, clash of interests, as they say. So if the children bear witness for their father, we won't accept it. You've got to bring someone else. And he didn't have others who were ready. So Shuraih decided, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, with all due respect, with all absolute due respect, I need to tell you that I have ruled that this armor belongs to the Jewish man. Guess what happened? Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu accepted it, he acknowledged it, he thanked him, he congratulated the Jewish man, and he's now going away. Subhanallah. But the Jewish man says, Did you see that, brothers? They gave me a discount. You see, it's worth asking for it sometimes. When you don't open your mouth, even if you have braces, you don't open your mouth, subhanAllah, you know what happens? You don't get. Subhan. You got to speak to be able to get. They gave me 10 whole minutes extra. So here we're going, inshallah. Don't worry, I won't take up so much because there are prizes to come just now, and I don't wish to actually spoil the show. But the Jewish man, subhanAllah, he looks at Shuraih and he looks at Amirul Mu'mineen who appointed him. And he says, wow, subhanallah, look at this. The Amir is actually being told that this is the Jewish man's. And in the heart of the Jewish man, he knew, you know what, this does belong to him actually. So he says, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh. He says, I bear witness there is none worthy of worship besides Allah. And I'm entering the fold of Islam by bearing witness that Muhammad, peace be upon him, is indeed the messenger of Allah. If this is the quality that he taught, and if these are the people that he built, then I am part of them. Subhanallah. Question I have for you and I. When the non-Muslims see us, I think a lot of the times they run away from the deen. In a lot of cases. Why? Because we are not living up to what we should be. Where is the sense of justice? Where is your courtesy, your humility, your honesty, your humbleness? Where is it gone? O oh, Ummah of Muhammad, peace be upon him. These are the men whom he built. What about us? Wouldn't we like to be the true ambassadors? Don't you want to be one of those who will go into paradise? Well, those were the qualities of those who were told you are from paradise. What about us? Let's develop some of these qualities. When people see you, they should want to be like you. When people see what you do, they should feel connected to you. When people see how you say things and how you address them, they should feel respected and they should really feel the connection because you are human beings after all. Subhanallah. Let's learn to respect one another. Humanity at large. We are part of one family. We are related. Every one of us here is related and all those on earth are related because guess where we came from? The Prophet Noah, may peace be upon him. And before that, the Prophet Adam, may peace be upon him. Our forefather, may Allah grant us ease and goodness. Imagine this beautiful story. The character and conduct of the people, the justice system drew them towards Islam. Today, a lot of things even drift the Muslims away from Islam. You have a Muslim, a sister, a brother, they are struggling with a few things. And the first thing as you meet them, instead of Assalamu Alaikum, you say Astaghfirullah. I mean, is there a reply for that? Am I supposed to reply you somehow? You know, when someone greets you, you're supposed to greet back with a better greeting. So if someone says Assalamu Alaikum, what should we say? May peace be upon you. That we say Wa Alaikum Assalam. May peace be upon you too. Wa Rahmatullah. And the blessings and the mercy of Allah. Wa Barakatuh. And the, and the blessings of Allah. That's what we should say. But nowadays you see someone, just because of the way they're dressed, you say Astaghfirullah. Well, brother or sister, if that happens to you, I can teach you a better reply. If someone looks at you and says, Astaghfirullah. Say, La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. That's all you got to do. That's it. And I promise you, they'll just look at you. <laughs> And then you can tell them, look, the Quran says, when you greet me with a greeting, I would greet with a better greeting, inshallah. So, you know, you sought Allah's forgiveness for you. And I said, indeed, 
all might and power belongs solely to Allah. Subhanallah. There we are. But my brothers and sisters, on a more serious note, let's never judge people. You don't know the struggles of people. You don't know what they may be going through. One little push, one small good deed from you might actually change their life. People are struggling. People are going through so much. We're all going through so much. In the same way, we wouldn't like people judging us. We shouldn't judge them. Not at all. No one for that matter. Keep guiding. Keep being kind. And inshallah, you will see the doors opening, the doors of goodness. Getting back to the life of Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. He was actually murdered. He was murdered in the year 40 Hijri by a man known as Abdurrahman ibn Muljim. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from fitna. The lesson I learned from it, and I'm going to close with this, is if people try to create disunity amongst you and hatred amongst you, don't allow that to happen. Do not allow that to happen. When people spew hate, don't let it filter into your heart. No, we should never be tasting wrath from one another. But rather, when you see a fellow believer, you should feel so good. You should feel calm. You should feel that I have a brother. I have a sister. And in order to feel that feeling, you should give it to others as well. The problem today across the globe, we find that we are affected negatively more from members of our own ummah than anyone else. If you look at the fighting and the killing across the globe, a lot of it are people who read the Shahada fighting one another. A lot of it are people who read the Shahada killing one another. It's happening in our homes sometimes where we don't get along with those whom we have a million things in common with. I want to ask you to take home today something powerful and that is, do I spread love or hate? Question. Take that question home with you. Do I spread love or hate? That's the question. Wallahi, your life will change. If you want to answer that with love, your life will change. And that starts with your spouse, your parents, your children, your in-laws, your outlaws, whoever they are. Sorry, whoever they are. Subhanallah, your community, those you agree with, those you disagree with, those whom you disagree very strongly with. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all ease. Barakallah feekum. I've seen he said three minutes to go. MashaAllah tabarakallah. Brother, I will give you those three minutes inshallah. So I'll end here and now. May Allah bless us all. Aqulu qawli hadha wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallah bihamdihi subhanakallahum wa bihamdik. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayka.